Whereas around 80% of the public in the UK, Finland and Sweden blame Russia mostly or entirely for the war in Ukraine, this view is by no means universal. Russian propaganda may get short shrift here, but it is far more persuasive and pervasive in countries like Bulgaria and Greece, where higher percentages of the population blame NATO more than Russia as the primary cause of the conflict. Today, I'm talking to one of the UK's most experienced military men, not just about the execution and impact of the conflict, but also about how the struggle for victory is one of competing narratives, where information has become weaponized by propagandists, where the Kremlin is creating a parallel reality of victory and victimhood to justify their crimes against humanity and Ukraine. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the material we create and are interested in our fantastic guests, please like and subscribe to help boost the popularity of our videos in YouTube. Today, I'm joined by Robin Horsfall, joined, uh, who joined the British Army at the age of 15 in 1972. He served with the Parachute Regiment and 22 Special Air Service. He left the British Army in 1984 and worked as a mercenary bodyguard and as a medical officer in many active zones around the world. He then built London Karate for 22 years, teaching thousands the art and discipline of karate. When he broke his neck, he retired and went to Surrey University, age 56, and graduated in English literature and creative writing three years later. He's the author of several books, including the hugely successful autobiography, Fighting Scared. He is in demand as an after-dinner speaker and campaigns against the persecution of war veterans and has plans for a veteran human rights campaign. Also, you can find everything about him on his website, robinhorsfall.co.uk. Have I got that right? Spot on, yes, absolutely right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's dive straight into the questions. Russia lost the Battle of Kiev and failed to take Kharkiv. They also surrendered extensive territories in the north. Does the Donbass campaign suggest that they've learned the lessons from their failed strategies or not? Yeah, I think um, they, have, they have clearly learned some lessons. I mean, they, they attempted a blitzkrieg type invasion at um, the worst possible time of the year when it was winter, the ground was wet and their armor couldn't deploy across the open plains, they had to go down the roads. And consequently, they got themselves trapped, um, which was a huge, a huge blunder on behalf of their general staff and on their commanding officers and their planning. It was an absolute disaster. And estimates have been up to 25, 30% of that particular armed force were destroyed and they had to retreat. Now they've gone back round to the east, to Luhansk and to Donbass, and they've uh, reinforced and concentrated their forces now to try and create some form of success there. And then nibbling their way towards the west uh, to, uh, with huge amounts of artillery, uh, flatten everything, destroy everything that's in their path, and then walk in with their infantry. So it could be portrayed as a certain degree of success after that huge failure. Um, there's an awful long way to go. And what can we say about the quality of the Russian army at this point, about its planning, logistics and leadership, and of course, about the quality of information that helped to inform that decision by Putin to go to war? Yeah, I think there's hubris is the big word, ineptitude, um, overconfidence, um, hanging on to their history from the Second World War, because their campaigns since then have been minor, uh, where they've had overwhelming financial and military power over the small enemies that they've, um, they've managed to defeat in Chechnya, in Syria, and so on. So um, their staff college clearly failed to improve and modernize um, their general staff systems as the world developed, uh, thinking that they could simply overwhelm people with numbers. And they failed to do that. And they're still failing to do that in many ways. Their armed forces cannot be mobilized because they're not technically, as far as they're concerned, at war. They've got a special military operation. They can only pull up their 
uh, reserves if they declare that their country is at risk, the existential um, situation with Russia is at risk, which it isn't because they're invading another country. So they're limited in the number of troops they have available. Their troops are not motivated because they know they're invading a foreign country and they don't want to actually, they don't want to actually be there. So they've got no, they've got, they haven't got great morale and they've taken high casualties. Now at the moment in the East, they're on the offensive. But the thing about an army on the offensive is it's going to take far more casualties than the army on the defensive. So they have to put a huge amount of energy into taking a small amount of ground. The Ukrainians withdraw into new defensive positions and force them to go through it all over again. Now, that's something that can be done if you have reserves that can come in and you can keep replacing the losses but they don't really have that many troops to keep replacing the losses. So it's going to be, it's proving hugely expensive for Russia. Can they keep it going? They're going to get exhausted. Their, log their, their logistical supplies are going to run out. Can the Ukrainians uh, manage to keep on fighting as well? Will they get exhausted? Will it come to some kind of stalemate? We've yet to see how that's going to happen, but it's got to happen in the summer. And by all accounts, many of the Russian troops uh, are called from Siberia, from uh, provincial places, extremely poor places, um, and many of them are motivated by money simply because of the sheer poverty in those areas. Of course, the Ukrainians do not seem to be motivated by money here. They're fighting for their families, their land, their homes, even the survival of their culture. It's a very different equation, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's very different what you're fighting for. Um, an awful lot of the conscripts are not people from the major cities in Russia. Um, a lot of the young, more highly educated, better traveled young people in the major cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg and so on. Those young people are questioning this straight away and saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be involved with this. I am not going. Um, once you get out of uh, Moscow, you get across the Urals and into the into Siberia. Then you can start to persuade people that it's the right thing to do for Mother Russia, and they're going to go. They're not high, necessarily highly educated, not linked to the internet, not subject to international opinions. So they're the people that are turning up, um, but they only have to be in the front line for a few weeks to discover how expendable they are, and to listen to the more experienced troops. Uh, to for their morale to go downhill. And it's also been said that uh, the secret services closely follow the troops, both to intimidate their own recruits, but also to bring torture and terror to captured Ukrainian troops. I mean, what's, what's your view on, on that, that it's not just coercion within the military, but you have a fairly sort of nasty rear guard keeping an eye on everyone? Well, all armed forces have um, a police capacity to try to stop people deserting, uh, running away and breaches of discipline, low morale, etc. <clears throat> I think, though, that the um, again, going back to the Russians clinging to the past, when they had uh, when they had the Soviet Union, they had the Cheka following up behind the troops. Um, you could be executed on the spot by any commissar for retreating. Then. There was a great, there was a simple case of, well, I've got to go forward because if I go back, I'm definitely dead. So um, they can't do that today. There's already um, reports, uh, recorded reports of soldiers rebelling, soldiers turning around, soldiers killing their own officers. Um, and there isn't enough political force in the rear to carry out the death sentence and to execute people. So I think that. This is just another reflection of low uh, morale in the Russian forces. They will try to make a huge issue out of every small gain. Um, Luhansk, uh, Lysychansk and so on, um, uh, Mariupol. But the cost that they're having to pay for these small gains um, in, in the real um, world of the military command is not going to in any way reflect the propaganda that they're putting out.
And it, uh, it puts the propaganda in some kind of perspective, doesn't it? If they struggle to take uh, Lysychansk, um, then they're not going to really ride over uh, any Western capitals anytime soon. Well, that's right. Um, their, the myth of their invincibility and their size and their power has been blown away by the um, defensive abilities of little Ukraine. And um, it's been a shock, but that defense has been enhanced by the high tech um, shoulder fired um, and uh, anti aircraft weapons and systems that Ukraine spent the last 20 years bringing into their own armed forces, plus the fact that they had training from Canada, USA, UK, Israel to bring their armed forces up to date so that soldiers could use their own initiative, junior officers could use their own initiative in the battlefield. And this allowed them to mount um, insurgency uh, campaigns uh, on the Russian flanks when they advanced towards Kyiv. So it's, um, yeah, the, they've done extraordinarily well already and they have a lot to be proud of, the Ukrainians. But um, are we going to continue to support them? If the West continues to supply the treasure and the weapons, then I think they can actually uh, turn Russia around and send them back. And um, I heard one uh, veteran war correspondent say that war is war, um, to perhaps suggest that the atrocities we see the Russian army committing are kind of normal in the context of conflict. But is it normal? Or is there something especially brutal and cynical about the way Russians wage war? Well, the Russians have a different culture and they do wage war in a different way. I mean, historically, you go back to the Mongols with them and um, the, the simple fact that human life doesn't carry the same value that it does in the West, where we all think we're going to live forever and that every life is valuable. Um, the Russians are far more philosophical about death and uh, how short it can be and tragedy. It's part of their, it's part of their written literal history. So um, they regard um, what we call atrocities as, other, as simply other weapons of war, um, terrifying the people, bombing the cities, long range missiles, executing um, members of the public. It's just a weapon of war to them, um, whereas we would regard it as something horrific and terrible. And you can extend that, can't you, to the uh, destruction of clinics, hospitals, schools, shopping centres, cultural institutions. And of course, we've seen a lot of targeting, deliberate targeting of civilian infrastructure. So what you're basically saying is that this is just a strategy to them. Everything is, is, uh, is a target. Yeah, it's, uh, it's deliberate. These are not accidental strikes in most cases. Some of them are just misses. Um, but... In, in effect, they don't care. They're quite happy to kill civilians if it means they're going to achieve, to achieve their objectives. Killing civilians is just another problem that they have to overcome. Uh, killing people in hospitals, anything that supports the enemy system in order to get their troops back to work, make them feel good about life, make them feel safe, they'll attack it. Um, it's like a huge and um, emotionless game of chess. You just simply have to win in the end, regardless. That's a strategy. Um, the propaganda on our side, uh, portraying them as evil, wicked people in our culture, that's exactly what they are because of the way they're behaving. But if you put it on a chessboard and take the emotion out of it, it's simply a strategy to achieve uh, a victory. And is this why um, countries that border Russia, that were part of the Soviet Union, have a far closer understanding of what it's like to be on the, the sharp end of Russia's strategies there. They're obviously much more active, much more aware of uh, the threat from Russia than perhaps Western Europe has been. Yeah, they, they know the game really well. Um, they expect people to lie to them. The, the simple point is that a lie is a weapon. A lie is a way of achieving your objective. So you lie when you can, and you tell the truth when it's useful, but there's no honor in the system. So when we ridicule um, Putin for opening his mouth and outcome the, the untruths, the lies, the propaganda, 
he knows exactly why and what he's doing it for. It's to create confusion. It's to create doubt. It's to um, motivate his own people. It's to and they just tell the lie over and over and over again. We're not the only people in the world to do it. We've watched Donald Trump do it for five years. Exactly the same method methodology. So it's not um, it's not a purely uh, Eastern European and Russian system of um, of getting what you want. And uh, to an extent, uh, I mean, it's a political strategy, but also um, if you listen to Khodorkovsky and some of the others, and they've been saying for many years that essentially it's a mafia regime. And, and, and if you link that to Trump, again, the way he ruled, the way he coerced people um, had a certain, uh, you know, mafia style to it as well. Yeah, it, it could be argued that um, this war in Ukraine, this special military operation, which clearly took some time and planning, could have been coordinated in one of Putin and Trump's secret meetings. Give me the election and I will give you Ukraine. Unfortunately, Trump didn't win. Uh, unfortunately for Putin, Trump didn't win. I mean, this is a great Republican talking point. I don't want to get too political because that'll yeah, uh, upsets a lot of people, doesn't it? Yeah, but, it um, sure does. <laughs> clearly there was something there clearly <laughs> there was some kind of uh, you could say that Putin was an asset either in the uh, you know in in the sense of espionage or simply uh, he was providing a benefit to uh, to Putin but there was definitely something there and something behind the scenes um, which of course the Republicans will say oh well if Trump was still in power then this war wouldn't be happening now um, my point of view is the war would be happening and Ukraine would be losing it at this point. I don't know what you feel. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that Ukraine would have been crushed between two great bullies who were getting something personal out of the destruction of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the, the signs were already there. Uh, Trump's uh, unilateral decision to withdraw American troops from Europe. Um, that was a big one. His negative attitude towards NATO and to the UN. He was essentially giving the signals that the door was open and nothing was going to happen. Um, and so the plans were made. In comes, um, in comes Vladimir Putin, because the plan has already been made before the um, general election in the USA, the presidential election in the USA, uh, because that plan's already been laid. And there was a lot of confusion and a lot of weakness shown um, from NATO from the USA, and he still believed he could push through with it. Um, the thing about the thing that bonds people uh, in the democracies more than anything else, though, is a common enemy and a common threat. And um, I've been extraordinarily impressed by the way NATO, the EU, Australia, New Zealand, America have suddenly risen to this challenge and started to come together. And I think that's a huge shock to, um, to Vladimir Putin himself. And if we look at the rules-based system, which the, uh, the, the West tries to live by, uh, which, is, which is mocked, obviously, in Russian propaganda, and we look at it in the context of Geneva Conventions, we do have a certain framework, even for the execution of warfare, don't we? Uh, a certain code around the treatment of POWs. What does it say about Russia and its proxies in the Donbass and their attitude to the rule of law um, in the way they treat POWs? And specifically, I'm talking about the threat to execute serving members of the Ukrainian army. Yeah, I mean, those people have been taken as hostages. Um, I would imagine that almost all of the people who have been captured have actually been serving Ukrainian soldiers. So they're not British soldiers, American soldiers, Moroccan soldiers, or any other country's soldiers. They are the soldiers of Ukraine. Um, they just happen to have been born in other countries. So they're entitled to the same rights as other Ukrainian soldiers. They're held as hostages. They're threatened with death because um, Putin knows how abhorrent the death sentence is to anybody. They, they're being used as political pawns. If, however, they're put to death, they lose that value. So I think there's a possibility of one of them being put to death to prove that he will, but he can't put them all to death because he will lose the value of those hostages. Um, and it will create a huge amount of anger 
amongst Ukrainian forces and the Western powers. And so if there was any doubt that countries would continue to supply money and arms and ammunition and medicines, an ex the execution of or murder of a uh, captured prisoner would be enough to keep that system going. And if we look at that historically, I mean, there's some truly shocking things taking place. There's filtration camps uh, with uh, you know, interrogation and torture. There is the wholesale deportation uh, of people to Russia, including the forcible adoption of tens of thousands of Ukrainian children into Russian families. And you can only imagine how horrific that is uh, for the individuals uh, that are subject to that. How close is Putin's regime to going down in history as something you know, in the order of a, a sort of Stalinist or Nazi regime? Yeah, I think um, only in the last seven months, but they've suddenly taken this step in that direction. So whatever, I mean, you, you can spend your whole life doing a lot of good things and then you murder somebody. You're a murderer forever. So Putin's taken that step. He's, he's done what Russians would regard as a lot of good things with his autocratic government. Although they've acted as a mafia, although they've ripped off uh, their own country's um, resources, they, um, they, Russian standards of living in many cases have actually risen. So. Russians have become freer, they've traveled across the world, they've uh, improved their education. But he's now fighting a war where tens of thousands of young Russian men are dying. Um, he's losing face on the international stage. Sanctions have been imposed on his country. Those freedoms are being restricted. Um, where is that likely to end up? Well, he either has to keep killing people um, and keep putting people in prison endlessly, as Stalin did, or somebody's going to remove him from power. He's uh, probably hastened his own decline uh, significantly and by a number of years. Um, and, uh, and that really comes to my next question. You know, when the war was hybrid or covert uh, in 2014, during the invasion of Crimea and then Donbass, Russia did seem to win the war narrative, at least it invoked absolutely minimal penalties for that illegal behavior. Why do you think Putin has gone for a much higher stakes gamble in February 22 and a more direct confrontation? Well, I think um, he got away with manufacturing the um, insurgency for the Russian speaking peoples in Donbass and Luhansk, Luhansk and the annexation of Crimea because Barack Obama was struggling he couldn't put any of his policies through. Um, he had a very much a lame duck second term because the Republican Party refused to allow him to do anything at all, no matter how right. So it was very difficult. Also, he was trying to get his troops out of Afghanistan as well. So you get them out in one place and then you have to put them back in another was going to make it extraordinarily difficult for him. So. There was an element of expediency there too. It wasn't a threat to the West. Nobody was seriously fighting back in any, in any great way. And the government of Ukraine still was still surviving. The country was still there. Um, and it was working very hard to overcome corruption and do an awful lot of the things that the European Union wanted. It was applying to become a member of NATO. So, you know, what was going on? Well. There is a there is there have been um, reports that the big threat to Russia was economical. John McCain said that Russia was no more than a gas station to Europe. That's what it is or was. Huge reserves of oil and gas were found under the Ukrainian territory, coincidentally under the Crimea and the Northern Black Sea and under Donbass and Luhansk. Now, Putin doesn't need those reserves, but he wants to stop somebody building a gas station closer to Europe and cutting him off. And I think if we go back to a, a more, a bigger picture, a more geopolitical picture, it may well be that he felt his economy was threatened and that's why he wanted to create this situation so he could control 
the ground that the new gas station would have been built on. And um, I think that's, that's, that's a strong possibility. And of course, there's wheat uh, and food, which is weaponizing now. But if you look at the long term view, the control of Ukraine's black earth and that hugely productive region would give you leverage in the Middle East and Africa, which of course yeah. now is using a terror weapon. Yeah, that again can backfire on him because an awful lot of his support comes from um, comes from governments in Africa, especially North Africa. But down the um, uh, down to uh, East Africa as well. There's an awful lot of governments on that continent that actually have histories that their, their governments were formed from support from the Soviet Union. So there's certain sympathies there. So if um, the food and the grain and the corn and the oil doesn't get to those countries and people do have to starve, then it's going to be the fault of Russia's invasion, no matter what they say. And nothing makes people react more quickly than hunger. You can bomb people, they can eat. If you take away their food, then you've got desperate people. They're not going to wait. And the propaganda messages might start to wear a little bit thin when the, uh, the food runs out, potentially. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter what you tell people when they're hungry, they're hungry. That's all that counts. Yeah. And then, then they take desperate action. And I think that leads me very nicely into, in, into the next question. I saw in one of the articles you posted, and you're extremely prolific on LinkedIn, which is fantastic because it erases uh, awareness of the war and Ukraine's cause. But you've written very eloquently about a concept called the truth tap, with Russia restricting the flow of information to its people in order for the regime to survive, and the Ukrainian side opening the tap as widely as possible. Um, how might these different ways of controlling the message affect the eventual outcome of the war? Well, you can see the reasons why Russia would want to control the message. A huge amount of politics is about controlling the message. Um, they don't want um, their population to know any more than is necessary for them to support than, than is required for them to support Vladimir Putin. So the message they've received is they're defeating Nazis, they're defeating um, a terrible regime that's a threat to Russia and a threat to Ukraine. So they're saving the world. And um, you, can, you can hear reports, you can hear parents talking to their soldiers who actually have this message and believe it quite strongly. Um, as far as we're concerned, that's a lie. Um, the more the tap is opened, the more that lie is likely to be revealed. Whereas in Ukraine, they want to control a certain amount of information. They do not want people to know where the heavy weapons are, where they're arriving, where the troop strengths are, um, where things go wrong. So they've got a certain amount of control on that tap, but they want the world to know the truth and they want Ukrainians to know the truth about the atrocities that are being committed. They want reporters on the ground. They want freedom of the press. And they want um, that message out there. So that's opening the tap as wide as possible because they need the treasure and the weapons from the West. They need Congress in the USA more than anybody else to keep sending them money and support because without that, they're going to get exhausted more quickly and it's going to be a Russian victory. And turning to the North for a moment, now there seems to be a substantial contingent of Belarusians fighting on the side of Ukraine and by some accounts, they've become a very effective <laughs> fighting force. What challenge might this pose to Lukashenko in the future? And what's the strategic risk to Russia if that regime in Belarus collapses? Uh, I, think, um, I think Belarus is a wild card. I really do. Lukashenko has huge problem. He's walking a tightrope because he knows he doesn't have the support of his people. So if he decides to actually mount a military offensive into Ukraine, he's not 100% sure that his people, his soldiers, or his generals even will follow him. But on the other side of it, he has to pretend he's doing something to keep Vladimir Putin on his side, his side because Putin is the only person that keeps him in power. So it's very, very difficult. Will, will he jump 
and try to do something? Will he play a little bit of, have a little nibble on the border to please Putin? I don't know, but his troops are poorer and even weaker than those that, um, that Russia is actually providing at the moment. Um, so if they're used in any shape or form, they will be used as, as a distraction to draw forces away from uh, Kharkiv um, to um, weaken the army there, to spread the Ukrainian armed forces a little thinner on the ground. I, I hope, and I, I, but I don't, also don't believe that um, Lushenko is going to get any political benefit from actually carrying out Putin's wishes. Mm. It's just a question of how far his regime is controlled by Putin, mm. which clearly it's extremely dependent on uh, the goodwill from, from Putin at the moment. Yeah. Turning as well to technology, I want to, before I ask that question, another interesting one, of course, is that the partisan uh, Effect, effect in, in Belarus is, is far greater as well. We saw railway lines being blown up, roads being uh, attacked as well. And if he was to enter the war full scale, we could probably see a, a huge partisan effort. But even in Russia, there have been mysterious fires and explosions all over the country. Um, that is shrouded in, in mystery, uh, especially the ones that are happening sort of deeper into the country yeah. in Moscow and the Ural. Uh, what's, what are your thoughts about what's causing these? Well, these, these countries are as closely knit as England, Wales and Scotland. Um, so Ukrainians are also Russians. Russians are also Ukrainians. Um, one or two generations back, Belarusians the same. You know, um, they, are, they consider themselves to be neighbours and friends. Uh, with similar histories. So you've got a fifth column inside those countries to start with. You've got a huge amount of sympathy and close communication. Uh, there's a question as to whether these are special forces operations or fifth column or a combination of the two. But there's clearly too many of these um, mysterious incidents for it to be accidental. So yes, um, they're there and they're quite justified as well. Belarusia has um, allowed Vladimir Putin to position his army and invade from their territory. There have been missiles fired from there. There are stockpiles of arms and ammunition there. So they're legitimate targets. Um, Ukraine has to be careful because what it doesn't want is to give the excuse to Vladimir Putin that they're carrying out some kind of counter invasion and threatening Russia or threatening Belarus itself. So I think it's a, a clever move to do this and take no credit for it whatsoever. And if we turn back to the Ukrainian front, uh, the Ukrainians seem to have adapted and integrated technologies far faster into their strategies than the Russians. What are these technologies and what role do they play in this David and Goliath conflict? Well, they, they quickly, they before this happened, they had, as I said, spent years um, learning um, Western Army techniques, NATO techniques, which is great for them, and had some knowledge of um, and cross-training with the weapons that existed in Germany and Britain and in the USA. Um, but they were still working with old Soviet style and old Soviet, Soviet technology. So the change needed, uh, initially, the Western powers tried to supply them with any stockpiles of Soviet, old Soviet, old Russian technology that they had to keep them going. And during that period, they started to increase the training. They started to pull people back, put take them to Britain, take them to America, take them to Germany and train them in the new technology. Now that takes time because some it's not too bad with shoulder fired infantry weapons like N-Laws and um, right, um, the, um, what's the name of the other? The javelins. The javelins, yeah. yes, the javelins. Um, and so on, and the surface to, but when you come to surface to air missiles, and when you come to long range technical artillery, that's different. You've got to spend really the, the guys who operate it best have had over a year's training. Well, they haven't got a year, so they're trying to cram a working ability into a very short space of time. And then, and only then, is it worthwhile putting these weapons into country. So they've been moving them up, getting them close to the, uh, the border between Poland and Ukraine training people as hard as they possibly can. And only when the people and the weapons are ready, 
will they be able to move into the country and make a make a a strategic difference to the way the war is going and a tactical difference of course and does this partly explain the slowness uh, of Germany in particular to provide heavy metal uh, to the Ukrainian front they've obviously been accused of uh, political expediency delaying the supply of weapons they've been accused of um, having some kind of nefarious strategy to avoid Eastern Europe becoming the sort of center of, uh, of uh, European power and future and, and good old fashioned bureaucracy. But is it much simpler than that? Is it just sort of training that's delayed the supply yeah. of equipment? I, I, think it, I think most of all it is training and the fact that we, um, we live in democracies. So agreements have to be made and you have to uh, agree who's going to pay for the product. I also think that it's unfair to um, to point out somebody like Germany and say, oh, you're not doing it very well and we're doing it much better than you and so on. That plays into the Russian propaganda game. Um, everybody in the United, in, in, in the European Union, in the UK, in the USA and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan are doing everything they possibly can. Now, whether one side does more or less than the other is not part of the uh, programme that we should be talking about. We should be basically putting across the picture of this united force against this Russian invasion, because no matter what people say, propaganda wise, there is only one country that invaded another sovereign state without rank, without rhyme or reason, uh, mounted aggressive war against Ukraine. And everybody in the West is doing everything they can within their laws to make sure that that invasion is punished. And there's extraordinary unanimity, isn't there? Quite sort of unexpected based on what's happened uh, in, you know, in Trump's era. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary alliance of the West against this naked aggression. Um, given the amount of heavy armour, uh, high-tech equipment, drones, everything flooding into Ukraine, is it possible to say that this is the first modern war since World War II um, or, or a, a big evolution of warfare? Or are we just seeing a kind of preview of the high tech wars to come? I think um, we're seeing now the uh, new technologies that have come onto into the armed forces. Excuse me, have increased the uh, defensive abilities of the infantry. So the advantage has been lost by the tank, by the aggressor, by the uh, long range artillery, satellite technology. Drones have been a huge change. They've added another dimension. You've got eyes in the sky, constantly watching, seeing, bringing artillery into fire, uh, global positioning systems, um, being able to um, have smart artillery that can bring a long range missile from 80 miles away onto one a single building with extraordinary accuracy. That's, that's huge. It's making it so much more difficult for anybody to mount positive aggressive warfare. Um, whether it's the, um, it, it's definitely new warfare. Um, Vietnam was, um, was quite a big war um, and probably the biggest uh, since the end of the Second World War and maybe Korea as well. But we've seen nothing like this. Um, it's a testing ground for those new technologies. They're proving their worth. And people are starting to question whether heavy armor is as useful um, in modern conventional warfare as it was in the past. And does this help to uh, explain the purported ratio between casualties on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side, which in the Battle of Kiev, were apparently anything from six to one to 10 to one. At the moment, I think the ratios I've seen are four to one in terms of artillery pieces destroyed and of course casualties. Um, the Russians can take a lot more attrition, but uh, is the greater precision on the Ukrainian side, um, does that help explain those sort of uh, rumored ratios? It's um, always been um, military theory that you need a three to one advantage to mount an aggressive operation against enemy in a defensive position. I think that's increased. I think it's increased to maybe five or six. Um, you said that the Rus Russians can take more attrition. I don't think they can with the army that they've got at the moment. 
because there's more more parity than people realize with numbers but the russians are taking more casualties because they're being told to be aggressive they're the advancing army so but they have huge stockpiles where they have an advantage at the moment is with long range artillery they can hit the ukrainians and the ukrainians can't hit them back and make their artillery move um, air power seems to be very limited on both sides because of the air defense systems being so effective. But when the 155 millimeter uh, systems and the, and the uh, multiple rocket launch systems have been, the people have been trained and they start to arrive in the battlefield area or even just into the center of the country, then that advantage will change. And I think that that's got to happen in the next four to six weeks. I'm not sure. But it's got to happen before the autumn comes. I mean, some are starting to turn up, aren't there? There's the early sort of pictures and memes going on to uh, Telegram and other other channels. Um, but I guess it's early days on that. Um, back in, in in March, it seemed that these things couldn't happen, you know, come fast enough. But now we're four or five months in. It's clear that Russia's gains are fairly small and incremental so it looks like the ukrainians can hold on until that armor arrives doesn't it yeah i think um, it will um, but we're also we're seeing some signs of long-range artillery appearing in the north and in the south in, in the northern southern horns um at herzon and in kharkiv um they are there's 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 there are reports that uh, in, that long-range artillery is starting to hit um the high mars the 155s the rocket launch, multiple rocket launch systems um, seem to be appearing in those areas. So if you can't um, move everything, the extra five to 600 kilometers across to the central area and get it cut off, maybe you can start to affect the, uh, the horns of the, of the bull. And um, the most vulnerable place, I think, for Russia is down in the south, um, where the... Um, where they've been trying to push towards Odessa and they're getting pushed back towards Kherson. And if they can start to roll up that area, um, then it puts Crimea at risk and it puts the supply routes up into, through Crimea, up into the Donbass at risk as well. So we have to wait and see. They've got some good generals. They seem to be doing an awful lot of the right things. People, you can't criticize the Ukrainian uh, general staff. They seem to be doing an extremely efficient job of fighting this war. Um, who's going to last and who's going to win it, I think, depends on the support that Ukraine have. Mm. And I saw uh, Arestovich and some others sort of skirting around this topic, but it does look like the consensus is going to be towards the end of this year, probably more likely next year, uh, when Ukraine can go on the offensive and start sort of mopping up and pushing Russia out. But yeah. strategically, hasn't Putin already lost this war? Sweden and Finland have joined NATO. The yeah. UK and Western Europe have uh, are set to spend a much higher percentage of GDP on their militaries. There are NATO troops in Europe near Russia's border. They will increase tenfold, is the news that came through this week, and be on a higher state of alert and battle readiness. And Ukraine will end up being much closer to the West, possibly fully integrated into the Western alliance and the economic system. So this is this is already a defeat for Putin, isn't it? Yeah, I think strategically it definitely is. I agree with everything you just said. Um, and add to that the fact that they've now cut themselves off from the world markets, um, the banking systems, the um, technical trades that go on, the high tech um, computer systems that Russia needs for to maintain its systems, they've that's not going to go away quickly. Even if they say, okay, we're not going to advance any further, let's call it a day and hold it here. I don't think Zelensky is going to want that. But um, even if he feels forced to by exhaustion, Russia's cut off. Russia's been pushed back 30 years economically. Um, the West has suddenly surged with its uh, desire to obtain oil and energy from other sources. So that's cutting down their markets dramatically. There's only so much India can buy and store. They can't buy it forever. And then they're gonna to have to, if they have too much, they're gonna to have to sell it. 
And China's managing quite well without Russian oil. Um, it doesn't need more than it needs. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge failure strategically, economically, internationally for Vladimir Putin. Yes, um, he's, he's already lost on the political in, in the political game. He's already lost on the economic game. Maybe he's going to hope to hold on to something on the uh, I've got this piece of land in the east of Ukraine. And I'm going to hold on to that and claim a victory. But it's a, it's a hollow one. And this is an interesting point that's latched onto very effectively by Navalny and uh, you know some of his team. I've heard them speak about this. Putin has swapped a, a dependency on the West to an extent uh, with a dependency on China. China. Uh, which in some ways they are going to be far more brittle uh, in exacting value from that relationship. Yeah, China's like any other superpower. It, it does what's good for China. Um, and trade with the USA and the Pacific uh, control um, and Pacific trade with the USA is far, far more important to them than trade with Russia. Um, the Chinese economy and the American economy are massive. Russian economy is small in comparison. So, um, yeah, he can he can go begging for help to China and then he will be China's puppy. Um, and that's not going to be popular back at home amongst his own people. So where does he go for help? I don't know where he goes for help now. I think uh, he has painted himself into a corner. I think it's important that the West give him some kind of route out of it so you can save a bit of face amongst his own people because ultimately he wants to retain power in Russia. And um, if there's any way that he can do that, then um, perhaps that will be the off ramp and that was a point I interviewed a Russian journalist last week, and her point was that Putin wants to stay in power, not just for power itself, but to carry on thieving, to mm -hmm. carry on taking and, and basically raping the country of its resources for his own benefit and for the benefit of his, his elite. So, as you say, preservation at any cost uh, is, is yeah. the likely uh, way he's going to go. And... It's also been said that Putin is not known as someone who engages in compromise, but will rather try to escalate his way out of any crisis. Does he have any room to move? What, what's he going to do based on that reading of his personality? Yeah, well, the problem with tyrants is it's very hard for them to retire because they've killed too many and made too many enemies. So the second they step, up, step sideways and relinquish power, the chances are they're going to be dead. So... That's that's difficult. So giving him an option where he can where he can stay in power uh, with maybe with, a, a, you know, a, a reduced amount of authority would be preferable to him. All bullies, whether they be school schoolyard bullies or international bullies, um, are going to use the element of fear and escalate and shout and rattle and rattle those sabers and make all sorts of terrible and evil threats in the hope that somebody will back down. But when it really comes right down to it, are they going to do it? We can't afford to allow him to bluff us out in the West, because then the whole world might just as well sub, uh, submit to Emperor and uh, enter uh, Emperor Vlad. And um, because he'll just keep doing the same over and over again. We have to call his bluff. We have to challenge him. We have to say, well, it's your move. What are you going to do? Absolutely. And um Let's assume this ends uh, in Ukraine's favor. Even in absentia, is it important to have a Nuremberg style legal process after Russia is defeated? And should the propagandists who've done so much to stir up toxic hatred be put on trial along with the elites? We can't really have a Nuremberg style um, hearing afterwards because we haven't conquered Russia. So we don't have the power to tell anybody or arrest anybody or put anybody in front of even the Hague, let alone any some kind of trial. Um, the only way they can be punished is with international sanctions, stopping people moving, affecting their trade and so on. We've got, um, for, you know, the double freedom of speech is a double edged sword. Um, we must have freedom of speech. Um, but I always I've, I've spoken to the press many times and members of the press have entered things have said, well, we've got a responsibility to report the news. And I say to them, no, you've got a responsibility to report the news responsibly. 
And that really is a, is the, the huge difference. Our media outlets, especially our national media outlets, have got to report the news responsibly. Otherwise, they're fighting for the enemy and something should happen. But if we make a law to prevent people to do that, then are we reducing the freedom of speech and the freedoms that we have in our free democratic society? It's a difficult it's a difficult place to go. I think we should do more to shame people who behave that way. And of course, social media, the role of social media has been very powerful uh, in this conflict. It's been very powerful over the last four or five years, really since 2016, in sowing division, inciting groups uh, to, to push for their causes, right or yeah. wrong. Um, what do you think the role of social media uh, will be uh, in future wars? I think um, social media, uh, clearly it's new. It's, a gen it's, it's less than one generation old. And the effects of social media are a surprise to a lot of people. The power that it has to spread lies, to spread malice, to spread negative human emotions, to divide people between one side and another, whether it be race or whether it be political party um, or just simple opinion. Um, it's, it's, it encourages, it brings out the very, very worst in human nature. And there doesn't seem to be a counter campaign because it's common knowledge that bad news spreads faster than good news. And we, we, we all, our governments often talk about education. Well, social media is a form of education. At the moment, it's a very simplistic and dangerous form of education. And there needs to be some kind of counter propaganda going out there to tell the, um, to tell the educated side of the story, to tell the, to put across the empirical facts, to fact check what people are saying. And if people are constantly putting out negative lies um, and dangerous um, untruths, then they should be brought to task for it in some shape or form. And to sort of, uh, sort of end the discussion or bring the discussion to a close on a more positive note, uh, would a Ukrainian victory also be a boost, not just for democratic values and democracy itself, but an army that fights with much more democratic principles where command is distributed amongst many individuals rather than the Russian system where it's based on a hierarchy or vertical to use the technical term there. I mean, could this be a victory for democracy on several different levels, um, including effectiveness? Um, I really don't know. I haven't thought about that much. I think um, a victory for Ukraine in some shape or form is absolutely essential for the democracies to survive. I really do. We've got, I mean, Vladimir Putin isn't the only autocrat that's trying to control countries in the West. Um, and there's a leaning towards it. Right wing leanings are in France, in Hungary, in the USA and so on. So um, what it will do is it'll put down a marker and perhaps build up the strength of the free liberal democratic countries once again. There is a danger that we are because one of the things that the Western world has done is train and arm all its enemies. <laughs> uh, and so. We're in a situation now where we are training and arming the Ukrainian armed forces, and they are becoming one of the most powerful and well-trained and most experienced armies in Europe, if not the world. So controlling that tap that I talked about is quite important for the Western powers. Give them too much, they might even turn, they might become a threat to us. Um, so it's vital that as this war proceeds, and if Ukraine start to turn it into a victory, that they're amalgamated extraordinarily quickly into NATO and the European Union uh, to secure them as one of our allies. Definitely. Uh, and uh, seeing how Ukrainians organise themselves, uh, how they communicate, it's far more open. Uh, and there's a lot more humour and stoicism there than that I see in many Russians, yeah. which I think is encouraging. 
Um, they're a tough, tough, resilient people, and uh, to be admired, a lot of things to be admired about them, without a doubt. And my last question, really, to to, to wrap up our, our conversation: How do you see the next weeks and months playing out? I think it's going to be quite slow until the trained people and the heavy weapons start to get to the front lines. Um, I hope to see those changes and those effects before the winter sets in. Um, the winter will always slow everything down. War's a miserable experience in winter. And it will be miserable civilians as well, because one must assume that the gas supplies will be either intermittent or even cut off entirely. And that could be lethal for the population who have stayed behind. That's right. That's right. And uh, those... Um, those issues may actually extend into the Western European countries as well. And um, we should be grateful the fact that we might just have to put on our pullovers um, because that nobody will be knocking holes in our houses with big heavy missiles. And reopen a few uh, North Sea gas fields potentially as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Robin, it's been an absolutely uh, fantastic experience talking to you. I'm very grateful for you spending so much time uh, to record this interview. And I strongly encourage people to read your book, uh, which I'm definitely going to do uh, after this interview. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's Thank been you. Talking to you too. Thanks, Jonathan.